Hi everyone, so in this tutorial I'm going to show you how to paint this meerkat. Now like with any project I always start off by painting in the background first. Now this here I'm just going to be layering up my paint until I can hide that white surface of the gessoed panel underneath. So it's the same colour that I'm applying here at the moment but I do have to make sure that the layer underneath is completely dry before I apply the next layer. The reason being you will end up just lifting that previous layer and you're not going to be able to get the opaque look that I'm achieving here. Now here I'm using a fine mist spray bottle, you can see occasionally that there is a fine layer of water that I am applying to the surface. Now this is available on Patreon all as a real time tutorial so if you're interested in that I will link my Patreon in the description below. So my main aim here was to create like a vignette effect with a darkened edge and it got slightly lighter in the middle. I'm then going to be adding some bokeh effects with my airbrush. But here you'll see I'm just going to carry on spraying that layer of water, applying the paint and then using this makeup brush here to soften out my inner edges. When you're trying to create this effect or any kind of soft blending for a smooth background here with traditional brushwork, I would always recommend using a fine mist sprayer bottle because you are going to then be able to keep the layers wet for much longer and then get more of a sort of a blended technique similar to what you can with oils. So for the bokeh background as you can see here I am just using my airbrush, you don't really need a complex setup for this kind of airbrush background. A, my very first airbrush was my Neo Iwata and it came with a 0.5 needle and it worked perfectly for this kind of background. So I would always say that that's a good one to start off with. So at times you'll see that I keep on putting the liner up against the background so that I can see exactly where I'm putting these circles. Now I don't do this with every bokeh background but for this I wanted some of the larger circles to be right on the edge of the subject so that when I did put the meerkat in place these circles were completely behind the fur. So either using the line art provided with tutorials or putting your sketch onto a bit of tracing paper and then holding that over the top of your surface is a really good way of judging exactly where you want these circles to be. So once you've got those circles in place you do just then need to adjust the colour right so it ties in with the background. Here you can see I'm just glazing some of the lighter colour back over the top just to make some of these circles a little brighter. So if you've watched a few of my other tutorials on YouTube you'll know that I always start off with the eye first. Because it's where the emotion and the expression all stems from I want to make sure that I've got that accurate before I tackle any other part of the painting. So the biggest tip when painting any eye is you want to get your contrast really good. You want to get it nice and strong. So you can see here that I've got the highlight really bright but the shadow, the pupil and the area around the eye is really dark. Contrast is something that I focus far more on than worrying about the exact colour. And I speak about this in my video here on YouTube on my top tips for painting fur, which I will link in the description below if that's of interest. I'm making sure that with using a nice small delicate brush that I'm getting these very narrow highlights on the outer edges of the eye. Getting in these highlights is going to make the eye far more three dimensional. The darker patches around the eyes are very unique to the meerkat so it's important that I get them as dark as what's needed. If I have this area more of a darker grey rather than the black, these details that I'm starting to paint here will therefore need to be one shade lighter as well. That means that everything then around the eye ends up too bright and therefore the contrast is going to be lacking. So the nose is also a prime example of that because it's going to be a little bit more of that damper, wetter surface, it's going to be a lot more reflective. I need to make sure that the shadows within the nostrils are really dark and that the highlights are also really bright where needed. But not only that, I need to focus on where I'm putting these highlights. If the shape and the position of these highlights are not right, it is going to then completely change the look of that nose. So your highlights and your shadows are going to be indicating at the structure and overall shape of that animal's nose. Now of course the shape of that nose is going to vary depending on the subject that you are painting. But when you have an animal that's got a nose like this meerkat with a top surface and then a front surface, having these highlights and shadows in the right place is really important. When it comes to your base layers here, the most important thing to remember is they look terrible for the first few layers. It's meant to look like this. 
The Liquitex Basics, as I've said, they are naturally a little bit more transparent, so you do have to build up two or three layers initially so that you can get rid of that background colour showing through. Now, for me, I don't think that's a problem because I do think it builds up that extra depth. You can see here that I'm really hinting at the lights and the darks, where my darker browns are compared to more of my yellow ochre lot highlights. Building up my base layers more accurately like this has always been my preference, compared to painting down one solid colour and then starting off painting my details from there. I do think that sometimes you can end up with more of a flatter look in the fur. Obviously for this I want to go with something that's really realistic, very much like that photo. So that means I need to build as much depth as I can within the fur. What it also enables as well is I could leave this session here at the end of a day, look at that reference photo and my painting is already starting to resemble that meerkat. For me that's far more motivational, I think if I was to paint each individual layer it's at that ugly stage for far too long, it's more easily sort of have a more of a tendency to get disheartened. You therefore hesitate a lot more and then the painting takes longer to complete. So working in this way for my base layer stage has always been my preference. I have always liked to work in small sections as well. So once I've put the base layer of the whole face in, and that's quite a large area compared to what I would typically do, and that is only because this is a smaller size painting. But once I've done that, I'm then only focusing on one square inch at a time. So now I'm starting to build up the fur under the eye, I'll then start to go to the left and then work on the top of the head and so on. I find that this is a lot easier to then break down that reference photo. The one area really that I focused on throughout the Patreon tutorial is the fur texture. Now the meerkat has that fur texture that looks slightly soft but it's also got a little bit of a coarser appearance to it. It's got a lot of the fur details that look interweaved with various layers. That can be really challenging to paint. One of those instances where you look at that reference photo and you think where do I start? Which layer should I begin with? Where the Patreon tutorials are significantly slower and in real time as much as I can, I'm able to really explain the thought process behind the layer that I'm working on. But fundamentally for this, I was working from dark to light. With acrylics, as long as we make sure that the layer underneath has dried, we can carry on building as much depth as we need to from there. There is no limit on are you going to fill the tooth of the canvas, can we not put any future layers on top, we don't have that worry like what we would with other mediums such as colour pencil or pastels. You also don't have the stress of well what if I do a layer and I don't like it, because there are a couple of things that you can do there. You can actually use a technique with a clean brush where you can erase that layer completely as long as you make sure that whatever is underneath is completely dry or you can just paint over it. So acrylics are a really forgiving medium, they're beautiful to work with. And they're also a very versatile medium as well. So at the moment I've been predominantly working with my traditional brushes here to build up my fur texture, but now I'm adding a glaze. Now glazes are something that I work with a lot and that's why I like Liquitex Basics. Some of the colours are already naturally transparent, so all I've done is then added some of my water to it to thin it down even more. That's how I like to work and apply my glazes. And if you're an artist who does find colour selection quite stressful and you're struggling to mix the exact colour at that layer and stage, the Liquitex Basics might be a paint that would be better suited because they are naturally transparent and you can just adjust that colour very easily with those simple glazes. A handy tool that can really help with colour selection is an eyedropper tool. Now you can get those on photo editing softwares but also free apps. Now what that will enable you to do is actually click or select any part of your reference photo and it will show you a larger area of that one specific colour. You'll then be able to more easily judge where that colour sits on the colour wheel and then will make colour mixing a lot easier. So one of the biggest tips that I could give anybody for trying to paint realistic fur is really pay attention to your brush strokes, how long you're making those brush strokes and how thick they are. So here is a prime example, the fur on the cheek area here that overlaps the background. The brush strokes need to be significantly longer compared to the ones on the chin. The variation of the length of these brush strokes is really going to adjust the texture of the fur that we are painting. 
If I was to have made the fur on the chin as long as the fur on the side of the face, I'm going to give the appearance there that he's got a really fluffy chin. Now that might be really cute, but it's not realistic to that animal. So I really need to pay attention to that reference photo and adjust my brush strokes accordingly. The thickness of those brush strokes, as I say, is also just as important. So for the meerkat, the fur there is naturally quite finer looking. I need to make sure that my brush strokes there are thinner. So here with this liner brush, I want to be really easing off on the pressure. Now, like most brushes, the more pressure you apply, the thicker that line is going to be. That's going to be more obvious with a liner brush, given that they are used for creating more of those finer lines. And the liner brush is one of the brushes where it does pay to just experiment with it beforehand. So if you just have some normal watercolour paper and just some craft paints to start with, getting used to how much water you need versus paint so that you get that flow of the paint off the bristles can be a really good learning experience before you start using those brushes on your paintings. If when you're using a liner brush, you're finding that the paint is struggling to come off that brush, it's usually because the mixture is too thick. If you apply a little bit of water just to thin it down slightly, that paint should then come a lot more freer off that brush. An example of that would be, let's say you are painting whiskers and the brush stroke starts, it stops and then it starts again. That's going to be more obvious when you are creating these longer lines, but that there is a good indication that you do need to add a little bit more water to that mixture. And using a liner brush to start with can be really frustrating, but once it's mastered, it can really make such a difference to how much realism is captured in our fur. So in the Patreon version, when we get to this part of the tutorial, I really do focus on how to get that softer layer for the base layer stage. The main reason was the fur on the chest is slightly softer looking compared to the face. And where it's in real time, you can see how using the same set of brushes, but using different blending techniques and then layering those different brushes at various stages is going to give you a different effect. Now, when it comes to these details here that overlap the background, they make such a difference, regardless of the medium that you're working in. As soon as those details overlap that background, it's then making it look like the subject in the foreground and you're immediately pushing the background further back. If these details are not painted over the background, your subject will just look a little bit more like a sticker that's been stuck on, which is obviously not what we're going for. This is another reason why I like to paint in the background first. I don't have to then worry about painting my background in between all of these fur details that should overlap that element. One thing that I would quickly like to mention is normally you see me work with a sheet of paper under my hand. It's like a semi-translucent paper and it's called glassine. What that does is it stops me from leaning on my artwork or potentially smudging anything and the oils of the skin can't be transferred onto your painting. But for this, I am able to rest my wrist on the bit of MDF behind because it is a much smaller painting. Anything larger, you do want to make sure that you're either leaning on a mole stick or that you do have something under your hand at all times. The oils in your skin that do get transferred when you are leaning on any part of your artwork are obviously not archival. They may potentially affect the longevity of your painting. So it's just a good practice to get into to not actually ever lean or rest your hand on any part of the painting itself. Now that I'm getting more of the body in place here, you can really see the importance of working from dark to light. If I didn't have my base layer as dark as what it, I have here, I would not have those shadows in between these lighter brush strokes. The fur therefore would just not look as soft, it wouldn't look as dense, and it certainly wouldn't have this realism that we're able to build here. Whenever I'm asked why is my fur not looking realistic or it's looking flat, there are usually two reasons. One will be that the base layer isn't dark enough and the other is there's just not enough layers for that fur to look realistic yet. All it means is that you're not finished. Carry on building up that fur, adding additional layers, getting brighter as you do so, just like what I'm working with here, and you'll find that each additional layer that you add, the fur will start to take more of that realistic three-dimensional look that you're after. Now I never counted the actual number of layers that I've painted here but it is well over 10. On each individual section I am really focusing on just that one element trying to get that as realistic as I possibly can. Again that's another reason why I like to work in small areas. 
If I was to do one layer at a time, I think it's very easy to rush that part. You also end up creating the same brush stroke all over, which again is gonna end up with a very flat two dimensional painting. Now, of course, it is very personal to the artist. If you do find working in individual layers is how you like to work and you are creating the desired outcome that you want, then that's great. There is no right or wrong answer. But if you do find you hesitate a lot or your fur isn't as realistic as you'd like, the things that I've highlighted here may help. And it's something we don't always get right first time. So here, for example, I realized when I got to this part of the body that the base layer underneath was not dark enough. If I wanted to maintain the depth within the fur that I've created so far, I had to put away this detailed brush, make this area of the base layer darker, wait for that to dry and then carry on with my details. Now yes, this has added another two or three minutes to the painting time, but it is going to be worth it. If I'd have skipped this section and not made the base layer darker, this whole left side of the body would have been the similar sort of value. There wouldn't have been this shadowed section here, so this is indicating where his shoulder is. Going back to what I mentioned at the beginning of the video, how highlights and shadows are really determined by the underlying bone and muscular structure. There is a risk here that if I didn't darken up this section, I wouldn't therefore be replicating this meerkat as closely as I should. The anatomy of this animal would potentially look different. Obviously that is really not what I want. I do want to make sure that my highlights and shadows are as close to that reference photo as I can. And now that I'm starting to build up my details here, you can really see how darkening up this section has made such a difference. Something that I speak about in the Patreon version is the use of a rake brush. Now rake brushes are really good in some instances. What they are is if you imagine your hand and you spread your fingers apart, that is what a rake brush looks like. So for every one brush stroke you create, the brush is able to make five or ten for instance, depending on the degree of that rake brush. Now given how many brush strokes I've added to the chest area, yes that would have been a quicker way of doing the fur. However, all of the brush strokes would be traveling in the same direction. Which for something potentially like a Labrador or a shorter coated animal would be perfect. But the meerkat having this more textured coarser appearance where you do have some of the details that are in the opposite direction, you are not gonna be able to achieve that with the rake brush. So although it would have been far quicker, it wouldn't have given me the desired outcome I needed for the texture of this meerkat. I did find that for this fur texture, there was no quick answer, it was a matter of painting in each individual fur stroke. So here is a photo of the finished painting. Now that it's zoomed out, you can really see I've got that density in the fur that I needed, whilst always ensuring I've captured that light source. So I really hope the tips and techniques that I've shared in this tutorial are of use. If they were, I'd really appreciate it if you could give the video a thumbs up because it really does help. And if you'd like to get notified of future content, hit the subscribe and the bell button. And I'm going to be uploading another video to YouTube very soon. But if my slower tutorials in pastels and acrylics are of use, as I've mentioned, I will link my Patreon in the description below. If you've got any questions, don't hesitate to pop them in the comments. I'm more than happy to help if I can.